And Robert, you'll record, right? Yeah, it's going. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, webinar for this afternoon. This webinar is sponsored by the International Nurses Society on Addictions. And my name is Dr. Al Rundio. I coordinate the um, ECSS, which is Providers Clinical Support System grant that we are a part of, which um, we're a member of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. We're one of the member organizations. And part of our grant funding is to present four webinars each year for the next three years. So I'm very happy with this webinar. We have Dr. Kathleen Bradbury Golis, who is a associate professor at Drexel University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She's a family nurse practitioner in the family nurse practitioner program track. And she also practices per diem in a residential addictions treatment center in Southern New Jersey. And she is going to discuss a curriculum that was developed at Drexel to meet our state requirements for pain opiate education that's required by RNs and also nurse practitioner students and nurse practitioners in the state of Pennsylvania right now. We also know that many other states are trying to move to such requirements. So Kathy, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry um, is a CME provider um, our CMEs, uh, you will receive a certificate from AAAP, but also if you complete the online evaluation that will be sent to you, you will also, if you are a registered nurse, get one contact hour from the California State Board of Nursing, which is where RCEs come from. Okay, Kath, next slide. The overarching goal of the Provider Clinical Support System grant is to train a diverse range of healthcare professionals in the safe and effective prescribing of opioid medications for the treatment of pain, as well as the treatment of substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorders with medication-assisted treatments. And again, this webinar, Kathy will speak probably for around 40 to 45 minutes. We will then entertain questions at the end. However, you are invited to write a question in the question box at any time during the webinar. And then in the last 15 minutes or so of the presentation, I will read the questions and Kathy will answer them. Again, be certain to complete the online evaluation when it comes to you, especially if you want uh, continuing education credits in nursing. Next slide. So I will let Kathy take it from here. She'll define the educational objectives and she will go into the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. So Al had asked me to do this because we created something different for our nurse practitioner students. However, what I want you to know right off the bat is that the way we did this can be utilized in any interprofessional or professional learning uh, modality. So if you need something for all of your providers to know and to go through, then this is just one way that's easy and we found very, very effective um, to get the information out to a larger group of people without impacting their time, et cetera. So this one happens to be that we're going to look at the steps on how we created this pain management and opiate education program for our students um, and how it was online. I actually do have statistics on how it actually worked out for them. And then I'm also going to be looking at some of the requirements and showing you what's been going on advanced practice nurse wise because a lot of our licensure now is based, you know, our renewals as well as the initiations is based on how much education we have on this. So I don't think I have to reiterate how bad the opiate crisis is to anyone in the audience today. But just think about that since 1971, there's been at least $1, one trillion dollars spent on treatment. Okay, it wouldn't do a lot for our debt right now, but it would do something to cut down on our U.S. deficit. Of course, in 2017, and as well as 2016, the CDC and the FDA really encouraged all healthcare providers 
to adhere to the prescribing guidelines that were found in the risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, as well as prescribing guidelines for your state, et cetera. To do this, we have to understand that we have a consensus model. And I know that this is often difficult for people to understand, but many, many states have now made for or have considered making changes, et cetera, to their laws to regulate the scope of practice of advanced practice nurses, including independent prescribing privileges. I see the things I'm presently down in Florida, you know, about um, getting rid of some of the supervisory things, et cetera. Everybody's trying to make these changes. But surprisingly enough, not all states have gone that route. Remember that the consensus model is that there are four advanced practice uh, nurse roles, the nurse practitioner being one of them, but as well as the clinical specialist, the midwife, and the nurse anesthetist. Based on that, there are actually six different foci. It could be family, it could be adult gero, it could be neonatal, pediatrics, women's health, or psych mental health. In some states, prescriptive authority is granted at the time of licensure of APRN licensures. In others, the APRN must apply separately for those um, privileges. Differences exist in how much and uh, what type of advanced pharmacology and pharmacotherapeutics education a person has, um, and whether and how much supervision of prescribing must take place before independent practice um, and prescriptive authority is granted. In some states, they require nurse practitioners, et cetera, to get at least 2,000 hours under the guidance of a physician before they can actually apply. Variation in these prescribing laws also include um, some of the APRN roles can do it. Sometimes there are restrictions on what controlled substances they can do. Um, and the requirements for collaboration, all right? So in addition to these roles, okay, these population foci, you then also get into to de a designation of whether or not this population was primary care, whether it was primary care and acute care. This is usually acute care in neonatal. Pediatrics can be primary care, acute care, dual, they can get both, and they have to pass both exams. Okay, psych, mental health, the same way. So you have primary care, acute care, dual track, and then, of course, depending on where you are, are you then studying extra and getting continuing education and competency based on oncology, orthopedics, nephrology, uh, palliative care? So there's a whole gamut. The states are at various different levels. And I do apologize for this one. Now, I just want you to know Montana up here, Montana up here should be dark blue. This was actually, <clears throat> this one was actually from, um, I believe it was from April of last year. However, there is a new map out. So they're trying to update people, okay, on their points and things like that. And what happens here, there's actually a new one as of January of this year. Um, and basically the really, really dark ones have full implementation of the consensus model in their states. So in response to the national opiate um, <clears throat> crisis, many states have adopted new rules, passed new laws, regulations, or the various um, places are fighting for it. The various organizations are fighting for who can do what. This is a way that they actually um, updated it. So I'm going to go with the first two. Of course, this is an entire um, model, okay? And how they did the points for you to get 28 points is 100%. That means you have independent practice in all of the roles. And as you can see moving across, yes, you do have the title. Yes, it's all four roles. Yes, there is a licensure. Yes to the, to the education. Yes to the certification. And then each of the ones, if they have independent practice and independent pr prescribing. 
Going along, one of the lower ones, of course, is Alabama. No, they don't. No, okay, yes, they have the rules, but no to the licensures. Yes, they expect all of these things, but as you can see, the CNS may have some independent practice, and I'm sure that that has to do, if I had to guess, you know, with especially psych mental health, but no, there is no independent prescribing, okay, or independent practices in the other ones. So there is, so usually when you see these, and if you looked at the previous slide, 28 points is 100%. Of course, the lighter is 75 to 96. So this usually indicates total independent practice. There's no requirement for a collaborative agreement, supervision, anything. Not independent. <clears throat> so this is where these can, can be anywhere in these, but basically speaking, not independent is where you have to have a written agreement, um, specifying your scope of practice or what you can and cannot do in general supervision. So, and <clears throat> there may be a requirement for direct supervision by, you know, the physician versus podiatrist, you know, dentist, et cetera, like that. All right. And then, um, so that is how they kind of have done things. And they did every single state. This is the most updated um, actual map thing that I found for this. And it goes through every single state. You know what, what was really amazing to me, and I hope I'm not insulting anyone, was I always thought California was the most progressive until I met with a few of my students, okay? And my students from California say, oh my God, no, I'm restricted on this, I'm restricted on this, I'm restricted on all of that. But so this is can be found, I believe, trying to think it is in one of my references and it's a PDF that's actually attached to the consensus model mapping. So if you go there, you'll see that PDF for your state and where you actually stand. It does get updated quarterly. So what happened in Pennsylvania? <clears throat> well, Pennsylvania passed a law that basically said that registered nurse practitioner students, applicants seeking prescriptive authority had to provide verification to the board of having completed four hours of board approved education consisting of two hours in pain management and or the identification of addiction and two hours in the practices of prescribing or dispensing opioids. And this verification had to be received um, <clears throat> up to one year from the insurance of prescriptive authority. So it only had to be completed once. So basically what happened was for every MP student that we were going to send out, we, uh, they had to have the required four hours of education just to get their APRN licensure with prescriptive authority in the state of Pennsylvania. If you were transferring into Pennsylvania from another state, you still had to pr uh, show proof of this board approved education. But the school was saying, oh my God, where are we gonna find this to sign off on a certificate for every single student that had to complete this education? So it became a problem for our chair because Drexel has nine different tracks for nurse practitioners. Now, some of them like pediatrics, there's three. There's primary care, okay. Um, uh, acute care as well as dual. So the chair said, now where am I gonna find all of this information? Because they all had to have basically the same thing. Advanced form had some material, but there wasn't necessarily anything specific to it for addiction. So we followed the CDC guidelines, you know, was this presented in different courses? Where in the different courses can they show this? So she'd have to have gone through every single one of the tracks and gotten a requirement for this every single year. So her, it, her idea was, is there any better way that every single student could get this material covered, you know, everything that, the, that Pennsylvania required so that there'd be one spot she could go in, she would know the student took this, and then it would have completed. 
So following the CDC guidelines and the American Academy of Colleges of Nursing, Nursing uh, Education Initiative to teach all of these guidelines in all schools of nursing, Drexel recommended that the CDC content in all nurse practitioner tracks within what we have there is what's called track specific form. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and this is a course they take advanced pharmacology, which is very, very general, teaching classifications, et cetera, and then they go into a track specific. So as an example, just recently, I taught um, um, the hematologic medications that are classically used in primary care, okay? Um, somebody else was doing um, HEENT or respiratory or cardiac, what's used in primary care, because I teach in FMP primary care. So those courses, okay, occur right before they go into clinical. Um, but so what was happening was um, our chair at that particular time had to go into each of the courses, or did they have to go into uh, on-campus intensive which is where we have our people come in and they go through simulations, et cetera, was there, were the students being exposed there? You know, and she said, I can't do this. Um, it, it's just too hard. You know, we do use what's called aquifer or MedU. So we could implement an hour there, but it was just way, way too much for her to be able to do this. So the idea was, what if we infused, okay, all of the courses with one centralized um, teaching program or, or educational program on this? And this way we could guarantee that we got four hours, okay, and not, okay, maybe there was two hours here and an hour here, but you still had another hour to get in. And it would make it easier for the students to present a certificate saying that they then had completed it. So based on that, our chair did request one centralized location and we chose track specific form. One week is devoted to the subject of pain management, the prescri prescribing of opiates, addiction. And we decided they also needed to know what was involved with detoxification. It became a four hour instead of three hour lecture, but we made it online recorded. And um, <clears throat> so that what ended up occurring was um, we would have this and they would have the entire term to actually complete this. Um, so we ended up with, um, there were gonna only really, there's only really six okay, track specific farm courses. So that's where they ended up um, beginning. Um, and then what would happen is the process for this um, coordination, one person was designated to coordinate to create this online course. And if you must know, it happened to have been me. Um, and then I would choose faculty members with experience who would also be speakers who could address this. The process actually began in January of 2018. We were hoping to be finished by the end of February. That did not happen, needless to say. Um, and then um, we were hoping, but it did actually end up becoming by April of 2018. I had it pretty much set. Implementation was going to be the following quarter, which was winter of 2019 which was our January, which is when that course actually ran. So we could tweak it. We had some faculty members go through it, make sure it worked well, okay, for our students. So the designated faculty, and again, you can do this with any interprofessional provider education, nursing education, whatever you'd wanna do. Um, the speakers were, the coordinator, which was myself, because I worked in both family practice as well as in recovery. And I was to address pain management, et cetera. And I'm gonna go through each of the aspects of it. I made sure that the course met all the guidelines, just in case um, 
for potential AAC and CE approval in case we ever wanted to utilize this and standardize the course um, as needed um, as needed. So I worked on the guidelines and prescribing safety, that kind of thing. A second speaker was chosen who was a psych uh, mental health nurse practitioner who also worked in recovery and she was to address the signs and symptoms of addiction, dependence, tolerance, what actually occurred and how it occurred over time. The next speaker was um, an adult Jero certified and who was also certified in addictions and was also the past president of um, INSA. And he discussed detoxification, what occurred with opiate detoxification, comorbidity, et cetera. We also decided to put in a current trend. And at the time we had a PMP FMP who had just completed several articles, had done a lot of information, et cetera, on vaping. So she did like a little 15 minutes on vaping at that time. Again, it just began, okay. Um, the meeting started in um, January to discuss what modules will be added and that's how we came up with our program. So the overall program objectives um, were written and then um, the modules were determined. I was given the first two modules, which was the simple management, you know, pain management. Okay, things that we learn all the time, how to assess for pain, how to assess for addiction, it should it occur. I actually did that later on, but stepwise sequencing. So looking at the who, okay, um, stepwise sequencing for pain medications, what are the non-pharmacologic me methods, the non-narcotics, et cetera. So that's what um, I ended up doing. Um, and then um, the opiate prescribing was just the description of the various opiates, their classifications, how to prescribe. Because remember, these are brand new students. They're not even in clinical yet, but how to prescribe them, when you would go to prescribing them, you know, what kind of plan you have to have in, um, in place for them, state monitoring process, Processes, you know, poly, um, poly provider, okay, and how to use it for opiate use if it has to be done long term. So that's what occurred with that. And our objectives overall were basically to recognize, the, you know, the common types of pain. So that's what went on in pain management, the WHO stepwise approach, applying current prescribing laws and regulations to clinical practice for safe and effective use describing the essentials uh, elements of responsible opiate prescribing, including the plans of care, et cetera, differentiating, and that's what goes on to the next one, differentiating, okay, physical dependence and tolerance from actual addiction. So Joanne was able to go through all of that, that whole progression, what to look for, what the drug seeking behavior was, how they, progress to heroin use possibly, and now of course fentanyl use, the overdose, okay, as well as um, the Narcan use. So that was another one listing those common behaviors to identify it. And then the last one was a case study presentation of an opiate use disorder, which was um, conducted in kind of like a lecture format, but it was taking an actual real case of someone, I believe who was on heroin, what occurred, the process of assessing that person, the comorbid benzo use and the dangers of benzo withdrawal along with the heroin use, assessment of withdrawal, so what symptoms you're looking for, those manifestations, diagnoses, and then the actual treatment. So our last one was this, just to describe the opiate detox treatment protocol. We didn't put one in for future trends only because of the fact that tre the trend may be different and we thought vaping might change from year to year. It ended up that this year we didn't have to change it because so much had happened in the past year with vaping that we chose to keep it in and actually the, prof the um, person actually updated the lecture to reflect this. So 
our learning management system that we actually use uh, is Blackboard. All right. Everyone has something different that they utilize. So um, what was occurring, um, uh, it was only the speakers and our LMS supervisor had access to the master shell. So there were basically six of us that were in the master shell itself. Each module had a standard format and I used quality matters criteria, making sure we hit every last aspect for the module, all right, for the master and for this actual program. The students were instructed on the format so they knew where to find things. And I actually have pictures of my screen that I will show you shortly on how we actually manage that. And the predicted date was the end of February, but it really took until like the end of April for everybody to get everything done because we're still teaching at the exact same time. So it was a little bit tough, but I went in and reviewed everything and made sure everything was basically standardized. So each speaker was responsible for one writing module learning objectives, just three or four, nothing, you know, overly pressing here. Okay, developing their slide presentation on their topic recording that presentation within the master shell. And there's numerous ways that you can do that. It's what the person was most comfortable with, but it, we're actually gonna move it forward and change it a little bit differently. Creating a PDF handout for that presentation so that the students can print them up and take notes on them. And developing and inputting a 10 question multiple choice quiz based on that subject matter. Each mat module was actually set up exactly as you as you're going to see it shortly with the module overview and instructions for the person, the learning objectives, the tape presentation and handout, the self-evaluation questions, as well as references that were used to develop that presentation. So this just gives you an idea okay of what it looks like in it in um everything and of course you can see it's all mine so um this was the master shell it was the winter of 1819 was um when we were actually implementing it so there basically were no announcements in getting started it's just that is one of the things that um quality matters really likes it says dear participant you know here is the following, um, this is what we want you to do, go do this, 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 you know, and after each section, do that. Good luck, we hope you enjoy this presentation, you know, and, you know, Drexel University. Of course, there's the faculty, that was a quick bio on everyone, so, um, so that they knew what our um, credentials were going in, um, as well as if there was any, dis you know, disclosures, et cetera. And course info is where a lot of the material that um, just that whether or not there were any disclosures that needed to be addressed, et cetera. Anything that had to do with AACN approval, we tried to put in course information. So what it shows you here, sorry, my mouse isn't working, is module one. Quick review, this is what we want you to do. Listen to, follow the lecture, complete the self-evaluation. The learning objectives were right underneath of it. Then the presentation, okay? I happen to have used VoiceThread and then converted it to Kaltura video. Other people did not do that. And that did create a bit of a problem okay, which was one of the things that the students actually recognized. Then, um, but here's their handout, they can certainly get it. Then there's module one, the self-evaluation exercise. When they would go into that, it would come up with their quiz. They needed to remember their answers. They could take it unlimited times to get 100. 
you know, it was up to them on what they wanted to do. It didn't show them the correct answer. It just showed them which ones they got wrong. And then, of course, the references for each of the um, for each of the modules. Every module was set up exactly the same. Module one, module two, module three, module five was vaping. OK, down here is the evaluation form. They cannot, OK, get out of that with they cannot get out of or they cannot pass this module, this this learning education program without completing the evaluation. Otherwise, they just don't get it. All right. So along that, so we had the overall program description. That's what went into course information. Most of these fell under that who our initial target audience was, because that was one of the things that the ANCC kind of wanted. And at this time, it was our nurse practitioner students at Drexel University. They had to complete this prior to the beginning of all clinical practice courses with an overall um, rate for all quiz modules to be 84. 84 is the lowest okay academic average for any student so they had to get an 84. most try to go back and get as much of a hundred as they possibly can some do not it showed about our planning committee you know our speaker disclosures it originally what the idea was <clears throat> was that we were going to complete this as a pilot with our students and then um, send everything into the ANCC to petition for the Pennsylvania state approval for this to be um, the man, uh, uh, an example of the mandatory pain opiate education for license renewals for all APRNs because our, and in Pennsylvania it's CRMP, but then that way all Drexel University faculty, clinical adjunct faculty members and nurse practitioner preceptors could actually take this and do it, get the certificate um, for free. And it would be kind of a perk, since we can't really pay our preceptors anymore, that this would be a nice little perk for them to be able to get. So um, our um, evaluation, the content was overall, you know, were the overall uh, program objectives met, session uh, objectives met, the faculty were rated, each module was rated um, for expertise, teaching method, how did the information, okay, change or influence disclosures, okay, um, learner, paste, appropriate format, time and minutes, you know, how long did it take you, and then any additional comments. The survey was usually done and successful completion of all the modules as well as this survey are required to pass this program. All right, so if they wanna pass their track specific form, they need to get a pass in this program, okay, to complete it. Um, we used a Likert scale, one being low, four being high, and um, that was used for objectives and faculty evaluations and then short answer or yes, no were used for the rest. And it was set up in a, as a test in the Blackboard system. And you, again, you can use any learning management system to do this. And um, that way, Blackboard actually calculates every one of the areas. So it told me, um, you know, who did 98%, who did this, who did that. So every one of the answers, except for the short answers, were actually calculated by the Blackboard system. And I can do it for every single term that it's actually used. So the initial run was done and we had 283 students across the six specialty MP track specific farm courses take this. They were given a pass-fail credit for the completion, but it was a guaranteed four hours. And the students had, um, at that time last year, they only had 90% of the term. Our terms are only 10 weeks long. So they had nine weeks to complete it. 
we've since made it 10 weeks because you know you how you have some students who just kind of wait until the last possible minute to do any of this questions on pain management were added to the final in every single uh, final examination of the track specific uh, course to ensure compliance with the course objectives each faculty member teaching were, was given access okay and to the grade center in the pain opiate um, education program they were not given access to change anything in the program at this time actually the only people that can do that is myself and the learning management um, system um, supervisor um, nobody else gets access to it unless i need something to be retaped or um, a change one way or the other um, once the, the, once it's completed the p is put in in the grade center of the specific track specific farm course and then that ensured completion of the program as well as all the material required by the state so you just knock it off in one big lump sum the chair was then able to verify that the students who took the this it took this completed the program and completed it for licensure so that then all the certificates were basically not printed up but were created and were able to be sent with the students upon graduation they would get these certificates that they could then do okay they could submit to the state other specific material such as neonatal opiate withdrawal symptom okay syndrome alcohol use disorder any other substance uses such as cocaine they were addressed in the specific tracks elsewhere i know for a fact that the very first course because we talk about mental health in the family track also talks about alcohol addiction all right now they've already completed opiate addiction but then they talk about the other forms of addiction and then of course um, the um, women's health um, program talks about the neonatal um, opiate withdrawal symptom elsewhere you know etc so those tracks take care of where they want to put that um, and then this is only this only deals with the opiate as well as pain management because that is what the state is requiring I believe it was because I had to do a licensure for Alabama and I believe I had to do theirs because they require or I had to submit that I had done something so that I could get my licensure for Alabama and that was just the RN one so more and more states are doing that the other thing is like the state of New Jersey I'm very familiar with you cannot get prescriptive authority okay for any form of a narcotic in any way shape or form without taking an additional six hour state approved course and they're very very specific on theirs so that's the next thing i'd like to do is maybe add the extra hours in that would meet the needs of our students as well you know that are in new jersey since our school is in pennsylvania so the overall um uh, program okay results i gotta tell you the students absolutely love this okay they rated the faculty the speakers positively they rated the objectives positively basically they said that 98.5 of the overall course objectives were met 65.7 being excellent 32.8 being good so i was happy um the session objectives 98 percent and with excellent and good okay coming out okay at the with that 98. the overall for faculty i combined everything was 95.5 their expertise was right up there presentation style okay was up there and i put in current trend as well so the problem <laughs> however the format basically they said it was appropriate and they liked that it was learner pace because they could go in do an hour you know finish one of the things and be done and then go in and do it another time okay um i had a problem okay with time 
I had put it in as an open-ended question. <laughs> Um, and it was um, basically about 79% responded to the time question. So that was like 223 out of 283 students, which wasn't horrendous. Um, most of the time, as you can see, the range was from 45 to 600 minutes. Of course, some of my psych people did it a lot faster, et cetera. Um, but the, um, but on average, the majority of them said it took four to five hours. Some said it took longer than that. Because that was open-ended, I actually had to sit and hand ca calculate down all 223 students. So it took me a lot, lot longer. And that was the first thing in this survey that I said needed to be changed. And I have since done that for the second round, okay, of, these, uh, of this program. So how did it influence their practice? When I went through all of the results for this, I came with a basically five themes. So yes, I did get to do quantitative and qualitative together. So they absolutely felt that this program was helpful to them. And subsequent so when it came to increased knowledge and awareness of the crisis, this was the predominant theme um, because um, when they were asked about how it was going to change, okay, in their practice, they weren't aware sometimes that it was as bad as it actually is. And, and I know that that's true for some of my family people, you know, women's health people coming in, et cetera. Um, Safe and smarter prescribing of narcotics. This was the second theme, okay, in dominance. And many um, students said that they were now more cognizant of how to prescribe and what they could offer first, second, third, before going toward opiate pain management. Screening tools, manifestations of misuse, and change in approach to the patients who may be seeking. Several students did not really know that there were one, different screening tools to screen people that could be used. They weren't all aware of what the signs of drug seeking behavior were and how they needed to change their approach with these types of patients. So that was very, very helpful to them because as they move forward, um, they have one course in between before they hit the clinical arena. So even if they're starting like our family people in women's health and things and mental health in the first courses, in the first course, you know, C-sections are often given, you know, pain management. So they need to be more cognizant. So this actually did help them that way. This one really talks to our interprofessional communication collaboration because they felt that there could be better collaboration with physicians and other healthcare professionals on recommendations on how best to handle these types of patients. Several of our critical care um, uh, nurses and our psych mental health students stated that they either have um, they either dealt with opiates all the time or sometimes not at all. But a lot of them felt that this information, now that they had this, would open up better communications in offering recommendations in acute care situations, as well as when it would be best to consult mental health, psych, et cetera, in the emergency department if they felt that there was something else going on. So again, this interprofessional communication collaboration is coming about in our RN level that now if we offer uh, better, okay, um, more information to them, they know how to better answer, uh, you know, uh, set up this communication with other healthcare professionals. Responsible behavior. So to paraphrase um, Spider-Man, one of my students uh, said, with authority to prescribe medications comes with a great deal of responsibility. So again, um, uh, you know, power and responsibility 
and they had to be more cognizant of it. So students did offer advice. Oh, so some of the general comments. Sorry, some of the comments um, that were made. Great learn module series. Just so that you have this, I learned a lot. Uh, look forward to my knowledge and practices in APN. I'm an audio visual learner. The videos were great. Okay, um, great presentations, useful, very informative. Most of the information will be used in daily practice. So even though they weren't going into the MP clinical right away, they could still use it um, the other way. And it's even making a, an impact on their daily nursing skill set and care. Oh, sorry. Let me go forward. Um, so they did feel, though, there were negatives, <laughs> okay? So um, they said, though the information was incredibly important, they found it that the presentations tended to be a little bit dry. Uh, you know, I didn't know how to make it better. However, there are more and more um, things going on with um, information, you know, like shadow health, et cetera. They really preferred voice thread over the PowerPoint narration. So um, two of them still have to be re-recorded. The other ones were re-recorded. So the voice thread where it flows as a video is much, much better. Um, the question on time was actually redone. So it makes it easier for me now to calculate it. I put it like um, A is, you know, under two hours. Then it's, you know, 2 to 2.9, 3 to 3.9, et cetera, up to greater than 6. And the vaping lecture was re-recorded to um, show everything. And um, but they and of course they were requesting things like nicotine addiction, but that's done in, pre, in subsequent courses as we go along. Okay, those are my references. So I guess I'm now ready for questions now. Yes, hello. Thank you, Kathy. That was excellent. Let me just go over the last couple of slides and then um, we'll review the questions. Just to let you know that the Provider Clinical Support System grant has a mentoring program, which offers general information to clinicians about evidence-based clinical practices and prescribing medications for opioid addiction. PCSS mentors are a national network of providers with expertise in addictions, pain, evidence-based treatment, including medication-assisted treatment. It's a three-tiered approach, which allows every mentor-mentee relationship to be unique and catered to the specific needs of the mentee. There's no cost. It's covered by the grant. So for more information, please visit the website that's listed there. Next slide, Kath. Oh, sorry. And um, again, if you have a clinical uh, question, please ask a colleague a simple and direct way to receive an answer related to medication-assisted treatment designed to provide a prompt response to simple practice-related questions. Again, you can go on to the uh, web URL that's listed below in order to ask questions. Next slide. And these are the members of the um, grant, the, uh, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry is where the grant is housed. Um, and then all these professional organizations um, are members. And you can see I represent the International Nurses Society on Addictions. So with that, let me go to the question box and see if we have any questions. OK. Have you considered adding recovery oriented language into uh, your education? I noticed you use the terminology drug seeking behavior. The language is considered labeling. Um, and in making the transition to changing the way providers think and treat this population, we need to teach recovery oriented language and trauma informed care. Many of these patients have trauma issues. And that's very correct. Many do have trauma issues. Uh, um, another comment was this sounds like such an outstanding curriculum is there any opportunity to offer this to non-directional students even if for a fee 
So well, those are the two comments. That was the, the big thing. I really wanted this to, again, be offered to our faculty, our nurse practitioners and things. It was very funny. Um, just recently, we were retaping, okay, muscular skeletal in the pediatric population, and my clinical adjunct faculty member was doing it for us, and he updated everything, and he re recorded it, and we made it into a, a lovely video for the students to listen to, and he said, would you mind if I showed this to my office staff <laughs> to get this, you know, um, for them and I said no so I sent him the collaborate link and he just actually shared that with just his office staff okay so that it was a good review for the office staff on just these muscular skeletal things we wanted to do this as an AACM project so that we could give this out to other people but no it hasn't been done yet um, I'm still waiting for the person who's in charge of that to you know, finish up all the packeting and things like that to um, be able to offer it to other people. But this is something you can do so easily in your institutions, in you know, in your curriculum. Okay, um, and um, so I, I mean, for your for your curriculums, it just makes it easier to look at your state requirements for either graduation renewals. You know, anything like that, you could, you know, have it and a person could go in, do it, take the test and then get the credit and then you'd be free and clear and you would be in compliance with all your state regs. It's it's really a great idea to do it this way. And again, it can be interprofessional, however you need it to be done. A couple more questions. Next one, how would training differ for an MP residency curriculum? Okay, residencies are different between schools. Okay, so at our school, we have actually, um, we have simulated patients, so our patients come and they act out a particular scenario. So that is one, one thing that occurs in residency for us, but you could have um, a patient who's coming in who, um, you know, once their pain medications reviewed and you find that, you know, the, um, the monitoring, you know, ha he's been going to multiple different things and then you could multiple different providers to get that. So you could create a case study scenario that way and then have, how is this nurse practitioner or um, RN or whoever it's going to be going to handle this? All right, and so you can do it that way. So simulation is a very, very big thing right now for um, our residents, uh, quote unquote, our intensives. We don't have a residency program, but residency also can mean that you're going into a, um, a particular, air, um, particular hospital and they're going to train you. So again, that can be done in case study format. There are two things that are out there right now. We have what's called Aquifer, which is MedU, which takes a person through a case study um, and they have to come up with the plan of care, what questions they would ask, et cetera. The other thing is there are a lot of programs that are out there. One of them is sh uh, Shadow Health, of course, in teaching. And Shadow Health actually in advanced form has a whole thing where you have to interact with an avatar um, and um, come up with, and I do know they have one on addiction. I'm not sure which addiction they have, but I do know they have one on addiction. Um, and what questions you would ask, how you would assess that patient, what, how you would screen that patient, how you would treat that patient. You have to go through the entire thing. It actually gives you a grade. Um, another program that has something similar to that is what is called iHuman. So that's another thing that could be utilized if you so chose to in, an, in a residency program. Okay, next question. I would like information about requirements for facilities obtaining pharmacy permit or DEA permit. Do you have that type of information in a training format? No, I do not. Yeah. I do yeah. apologize, yeah, I don't have that. Yeah, this one focused um, really on nursing. Okay. Do you all have training webinar on telehealth or telemental health? Uh, we do not, okay? We do teach our students about it, 
but because uh, but we don't, you know, and what is involved with it, but we don't actually have uh, training at this time. I think it's in the planning stages. I believe Kate's gonna like start something like that. And, um, but at this particular time, we just have a new uh, simulation coordinator. So she's starting to look at different things that we can begin to utilize and how we could utilize them in simulation. Okay. And there's another comment. I work in a prenatal center. I am a women's health nurse practitioner. We see a lot of patients on Subutex. I want to get a program started so our patients are not transferred out. They have so many barriers to care as it is. Are you familiar with any existing programs? Okay, uh, now that is where you're going to have to look at your, um, um, uh, your particular area as to whether or not, because with, of course we don't detox them. So, <laughs> so when they're pregnant and things like that. So there has to be this coordination between whoever is doing the recovery and um, the OB, okay? And it's very, very complicated as well as behavioral therapy. So depending on what is available in your state and in your given area, they are few and far between, okay? Because I work at a recovery center, but we don't take pregnant patients because the coordination between all of these individuals, social service, uh, um, the obstetricians, the um, recovery, the addiction specialist, the um, behavioral therapy, everybody has to work together. And unfortunately, those programs are few and far between. So you'd have to look for what's available or where that patient is getting their subutex and then set up a working plan with them to try to coordinate all of those things together. Yeah. And then uh, one other comment, we have behavioral health. This would be for, for maintenance and also a thank you. Oh, thank yeah, you. I practice in New Jersey as well in an addictions treatment center, and we, we don't take pregnant patients either. There's talk about that, but we actually, where we were referring, we we're southern New Jersey, so we're closest to the Philadelphia side of Pennsylvania, and it is to a center up in Pennsylvania somewhere who does uh, handle pregnant patients. And they can and then, still work with you, okay, yeah. but you just have to have this coordination between them all. Yeah. Okay. And then someone from Delaware come in. I thank you that she's happy to connect with the person asking the question because they provide OB care in a treatment center in Delaware. So the two of them right. connected online, which is great. Super. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Kathy, thank you very much for um, an excellent presentation. I think it's going to be interesting to see where uh, curriculum goes. I know um, one thing at Drexel that we're in the infancy stages is using virtual reality in some of the undergraduate programs. So that's probably the next step with a, a lot of what we do in education. So it's going to be interesting to see where, where all it goes. Uh, we appreciate your comments and feedback and questions. Don't forget if you are a nurse and you want continuing education units, please make sure you complete the online evaluation that will come to you. Again, as a reminder, you will get a certificate of attendance from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry. And then if you want contact hours, you complete the online evaluation. And then the International Nurses Society of Addictions will be sending you out contact hours. Um, we are approved, um, and Robert could answer this, but we are approved um, for uh, addiction counselors as well for contact hours. So we, I'm sure we can probably put that on the certificate as well. Good question. Okay, so thank you for being here. Um, I've got us right at one o'clock. Um, so look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. I don't have the exact date planned, but we will be doing two more webinars before July, and they will be announced by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, as well as the International Nurses Society on Addictions. And by the way, we do welcome all disciplines. We are leaving interprofessional 
uh, work as well. So anyone is welcome at these webinars. Thank you for being here. And we will now stop the recording and end the presentation. Yes, we will be sending uh, contact hours out for counselors as well. Just make certain that you um, complete the online evaluation. Thanks for being here and have a great day.